Hey guys, I just want to go over the Japan pre-World War II lecture with you guys or for you guys. Um, so uh, this predominantly is only going to cover like the last page and a half of chapter 12, lesson one. Um, and so I've titled it Japan pre-World War II. And underneath the subheading is Asia for Asiatics. Um, and I have that intentionally. It's a vocabulary word later on. In the World War II unit, um, but it really speaks to Japan's mindset even before what it was before World War II. So this is an extremely like nationalistic slogan, but more importantly, it's anti-imperialistic. And so what we mean is that Japan is slowly trying to kick out Europeans or non-Asians from Asia so that way they, as the most superior of all Asian ethnicities um, or, or nationalities, can control the less superior Asians in Asia. So I'm just going to keep that in mind as uh, we go through this lecture and as we move through World War II. Now, just to kind of give you um, an a uh, I guess, kind of intro to Japan kind of stuff. I do want to let you guys know that um, this particular slide on opening up Japan is not in 12.1. It's not tested, but it's super good background to kind of understand where Japan was coming from. And so prior to the 1800s, of the Netherlands, oops a daisy, Okay. And um, other than that, Japan was closed to trade. They weren't interested because everyone was trying to push their religion on Japan. And Japan was contentedly Buddhist at the time. And the Dutch gave no cares whatsoever. They said, as long as we can trade, that's all that matters. That's cool. And so the Japanese would allow it. Now, even after... I swear, like 20 years, I can still remember the story of opening up Japan. I never have to review it. Um, so during the age of imperialism, the United States wanted to compete with European nations and their ownership of African and Asian nations. And I remember the story of the United States coming in and opening up Japan with Commodore Matthew Perry, mostly because Matthew Perry was a famous actor from the 1990s and the 2000s, which is when I was growing up. Um, and so it's just always really funny for me. I get a little giggle when I'm like, hee hee hee, Matthew Perry opened up Japan. Um, but it, in reality, like, that was the guy's name. And in 1853, the United States Navy sails into Japan, specifically in Edo Bay. And uh, Commodore Matthew Perry is like, hey, can we trade with you? And just as you guys see down here, um, Japan says, no, thank you. We're all good. We don't need your trade. We've got the Dutch. Um, we're not really interested. And then Perry is saying like, hey, we have guns. And Japan is like, oh shit, come on in. Because Japan is not industrialized at this time. They're still very rudimentary, very agricultural, um, no industry at all. And so the United States ushers in that kind of key phrase, key word, um, industrialization, right? We're having uh, factories, we're going to mass produce things, um, and they're going to modernize Japan in a way that made the Japanese feel like they were the most superior of all Asian nations um, because Japan grew under this time, whereas other Asian nations under European control, uh, they were stifled, right? The Europeans just took advantage of them and didn't really do any meaningful growth with the nation. Um, they just took, 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 took. And Japan was actually one where they were able to grow. So here I just have a super random painting um, showing the forced opening of Japan. So as you guys can kind of see here, you've got all of the American ships out in the distance. You've got all of these American soldiers kind of coming up on the beach. And then here you have like random Asian couples or Japanese couples just kind of like watching and observing. Um, so the United States is showing a, a strength of force when they're coming in to take over Japan. Now, the rest of 12.1 is honestly, uh, for Japan, is uh, very minimal. Like, you're actually kind of staring at it. So, um, Japan, once they, uh, quote, unquote, uh, get their freedom, quote, unquote, um, they decide that they're going to start taking over countries and they're going to start showing that they're the strongest. Um, we saw with uh, the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, with, right before the Russian Revolution, that Japan 
won um, and they made Russia the laughing stock, right? And so soon after that, you're going to see that uh, Japan is going to take over Korea, Korea, and they're going to take over Korea, um, which you guys can see. Um, if we had done the map of Asia, you guys would kind of intuitively know where Korea is. But um, so here's Korea. And at that time, it's all one nation. It's not North Korea and then South Korea. That comes later. Um, but they're taking Korea because uh, Korea has natural resources. It's got land. And Japan is mostly a mountainous nation. Um, so um, when they realize that they need more land or maybe they just want more land, right? Um, they're going to head over to Manchuria. And Manchuria is one of your future vocabulary words. Manchuria uh, is just an area of northern China, and it's just above the Koreas. And you can see it's outlined here in pink already, but I'm kind of kind of do it in blue. Um, and the reason why we're going over to Manchuria or why Japan is trying to expand into Manchuria and actually successfully does is um, they've got tons of trees and natural resources and they've got lots of land for farming. Um, and so this allows Japan to increase their um, availability of rice and other foodstuffs for their, their people. Um, now, at the time in 1931, remember the League of Nations... Oops, a daisy. Um, the League of Nations was super weak. It's a peacekeeping group, and they're supposed to be able to keep the peace. Well, one country invading another is not very peaceful, um, but really all they do is wag their fingers because at the end of the day, does it really matter that a quote unquote group of inferior people are being hurt? No, not really. So, finger wag, right? the Japanese aren't encroaching on any Europeans territory. So it's not really that big of a deal. So Japan responds by just, you know, saying, all right, cool, peace, um, flipping them the bird and then quits. Now, under uh, at this time, uh, Japan has an emperor. I mean, Japan has actually had an emperor for a really long time. But this guy, uh, Emperor Hirohito, is your vocabulary word. He is the leader of Japan. And one thing to keep in mind is that the Japanese saw their emperor as a god, um, that they're descended from the heavens. Um, so even though Hirohito is in charge, um, it's really his ministers who are the ones making the day-to-day -day decisions. Um, and so the government under Hirohito with uh, Tojo, uh, with Hideki Tojo is going to be very nationalistic, right? And that's kind of code for our nation is better than your nation, which could kind of even be further extended into racism. Um, now, just in case you guys did not know, um, there is a deep deep enmity or a feeling of enemies um, between Japan and China and Korea. Um, and it's partially due to this time period, what the Japanese do, both to Korea uh, and the Chinese people. So nationalism, my country is better than your country. And militaristic is we're going to use the military to get what we want and to do what we want. Um, and so Japan starts expanding. And in 1931, they're like, you know what? This is just, it's not enough. It's not enough land. We're a good, amazing, strong country. We are the most superior of Asian people. Um, we're going to start this campaign for Asia, for the Asiatics, to get rid of all the Europeans. And so Japan's going to become even more militaristic. They're going to... Um, get involved in the Chinese Civil War. The Chinese Civil War is an incredibly important um, civil war in world history. It is 20 years long, right? 1929 to 1949. And um, you've got your vocabulary word. So your vocabulary word is Chiang Kai-shek. And he is a person. He is a leader of um, a faction in the Civil War. And then he's fighting for control over China against Mao Zedong. And so on a side note, even though it's really terrible that Mao would be a side note of history, uh, Mao, as he is lovingly referred to, will become the undisputed dictator of communist China from about 1949 until the 1970s. Um, he is infamous, um, just alongside with uh, Hitler and Stalin. Mao, we can safely say, killed approximately 100 million of his own people. Uh, Joseph Stalin comes in in a uh, second, where 40 to 60 million people and then Adolf Hitler, everyone knows the Holocaust with about 11 million people. Um, now, 
uh, on another quick side note, Mao is going to lead China. Chiang Kai-shek is going to flee to an island off the coast of China known as Taiwan. And I'm sure you guys have heard of Taiwan. Um, Taiwan thinks of themselves to be um, an independent country. Um, they have their own government. They've got their own representation. Um, they consider themselves Taiwanese. Um, but the Chinese do not acknowledge them as their own independent country. Um, they look at Taiwan as a state in permanent rebellion, and they just kind of consider them teenagers that will eventually come back to the fold. Um, if you guys are paying attention to the news right now, Taiwan uh, is trying to get uh, internationally recognized by the World Health Organization. And most of the world does not recognize them as an independent nation, because if you do, then China gets upset with you. And China is where most, if not all, um, of our goods are being produced right now. And they're also a, a big purchaser of things that we export. So Taiwan is actually a very hot button subject, just to kind of keep in mind. Now, um, the Japanese are going to take advantage because Chiang Kai-shek is losing this civil war to Mao. And so Chiang Kai-shek invites the Japanese government into China further, thinking that he's going to help them. Um, and that was very, very, very naive. Um, Japan uses this as an excuse to basically take everything. They, um, we refer to this initially as the Sino-Japanese War. This is going to be the first of many. And then I just want to let you guys know that Sino represents China, just like when we talked about the Russo-Japanese uh, War in 1904 that Russia loses and causes them to become a laughingstock. Uh, Russo is for Russia, so Sino is for Japan. And so this is uh, the first of many Sino-Japanese wars. And one of the most important things that we need to discuss is the rape of Nanjing. And it is a 1937 atrocity. Atrocity is intentional violence against a group of civilians. And the Japanese military goes into Nanjing, the, the capital city of China at that time. Now, you guys know I'm not really big on making you remember dates, so don't stress December 13th, 1937 too much. But this invasion goes on for six weeks. And over the course of six weeks, over 200,000 men are slaughtered. Okay, so that's 200,000 men who in theory would be the ones to fight back. They're all killed. Um, at the same time, this is an actual very, very low number. Um, 20,000 women and girls of all ages from like we're talking age five and above um, are raped. Um, sometimes they are raped by the Japanese soldiers. Sometimes they are raped um, forcibly um, by their own family members because the Japanese soldiers forced their fathers and their brothers to do these things. Um, and the it, it's unspeakable terror. Now, if you guys want to watch Survivor Testimony, you go into the other resources um, and you'll see them there in the videos um, that I've got. They've got interviews. It's very, very, very um, adult, um, but it's very, very sad. Um, so just kind of beware. Now, just to let you guys know, also Japan has never apologized for what they've done. Um, they just uh, not like kind of uh, talk this up as, uh, hey, this is wartime and this is what happens. Um, but it wasn't really that bad. The Chinese are making it up. Um, it wasn't that terrible. Our people could never do something like this. So it's a combination. Now, um, so now the Japanese have come in. They have taken control of China. Um, and then they have more expansionist goals. Taking China is just not enough. So Japan wants to start to expand into the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union has a ton of natural resources, oil specifically, but trees, um, agricultural land. And Japan just assumed because they're the most superior of Asians and Germans are the most superior of Europeans, that they would just come together and split the resources of the Soviet Union. But then, you know, that pesky, you know, non-aggression pact, the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939 is signed. And Japan is like, well, if we can't go for the Soviet Union because they're temporary allies, I guess we're going to go into Southeast Asia and look for those resources. And that's where they start stepping on toes because a lot of Europeans, quote unquote, good Europeans, um, and I mean that only by like 
they're white and considered superior. Um, they own all of Southeast Asia already. And so one of the biggest areas that Japan focuses on is Indochina. Indochina is, um, if you guys look on a map, it's kind of the area where Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia are today. Um, it's where the Vietnam War is also going to be fought. But anyway, so um, Japan starts to kind of creep in and the United States is like, hey, 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 um, you're picking on a friend. Um, please don't do that. Uh, we are going to impose sanctions on you if you try and steal this land. And so sanction is also a vocabulary word. A sanction is when you uh, threaten penalty for breaking a rule. And in this case, the United States said, we won't trade specific things with you as a punishment. Um, some of those things include oil, tin, steel, palm oil, all of which are needed when you're going to war, right? You need tin and steel to make the machines. Palm oil is to help grease the engines and then oil is to help make everything run. So Japan is like, all right, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's figure this out. Um, now history, um, you could go down rabbit holes for conspiracy theories, but um, it's at this point, Japan begins to plan for the secret attack on Pearl Harbor in response. Um, Pearl Harbor, this is a date you do need to know. This is one of those like testable dates. December 7th, 1941 is day that the United States was attacked. Um, now I use that loosely because the United States just owned Hawaii. It wasn't a United States state. It was a territory. Um, but we used the islands of Hawaii for our naval base. So um, the Japanese uh swear that it was not a secret attack that they warned us they have an honorable code of fighting that they wouldn't have done this and then other people are like nah it's bull man they totally like snuck attack us so you can go down a nice long deep dive about whether or not they really sent us a fax and let us know and because it was a weekend we didn't get it um december 7th by the way is a sunday um and so this whole event, the killing of almost 3,000 um, U.S. officers and then civilians living on the island was in retaliation, right, because they're super upset with the United States and because we're not letting Japan what they want to do, which is become an imperialist nation, just like the United States, just like Germany, just like everyone else. So um, I really hope that um that this kind of helps clarify japan's mindset um at the start of world war ii that they just wanted to be like everybody else and they thought they were more superior than um, other countries and they just developed a very aggressive militaristic stance that will ultimately cause the united states to declare war against them in uh the pacific um yeah so uh if you guys have any questions make sure you email me hope this helps bye